I want to start with a personal anecdote. When I was a small child, I grew up in London and we had a Victorian lady and her thing to do was on the weekends to take my sister and I to museums. She was in her late 70s. She took me to the Natural History Museum, the British Museum, the Victorian Albert Museum, which was right nearby, and we used to wander around and it was a great deal of walking, a huge amount of reading, a vast amount of looking at things that I didn't know very often what they were, and just a huge exercise in absorbing information. What was your earliest introduction to museums, Samuel J. Redman? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me, and thank you for sharing that great story. I, I relate to that uh, in that my uh, parents were uh, into history and, and science and, and travel, so museums were, were part of that growing up. But they also, uh, my mom would uh, just pull me out of school occasionally to take me to the Science Museum of Minnesota or the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. I grew up in Minnesota. And uh, that was a really formative experience for me, of course. But uh, from there, I decided to start working in museums and eventually transitioned to become a historian who studies the history of museums. It combines history. It combines anthropology, of course, art very often, many disciplines. It is a truly multidisciplinary subject. But of course, Samuel J. Redmond, it has also become very contentious. I'm thinking, for example, of the Elgin marbles. I'm thinking of the misappropriation, as many would see it, of artefacts that do not necessarily belong to the museum owners. This has become a hot topic, hasn't it? Where do you sit with all this discussion? Absolutely. It has been a really incredible time for those of us who have been following and, and tracking these conversations for, for some time. Uh, I you know, have written about in the past, I, I come from, as I mentioned, a museum background and then became a historian. Uh, but I, my first book was on the history and legacy of collecting the history of human remains. Uh, which you know could not be more contentious and, and sensitive, right? The the way in which one's uh, ancestors are, are treated in, in terms of their death and burial, and and how those remains were scientized in, in museums. So it's absolutely the case that there's there's still a lot of work to be done. But I think in recent years, uh, one of the themes of this new book is that born out of these crisis moments are opportunities in many cases, to rethink museums, to uh, reshape uh, what they are and, and think about different trajectories moving forward. So out of this recent controversy around the ownership of materials, it is possible, looking at this sort of historical trajectory of crisis moments for museums, that something more resilient will, will come out of this. And that is relationships built with people from around the world and, and possible repatriation and restitution of these objects. Uh, your book, as you say, The Museum, your latest book, A Short History of Crisis and Resilience, it was born out of the pandemic, and I'll get to that in depth in a minute. The thing is that museums, the same time that we were trudging around museums, I was also learning about Darwin, who, mm. of course, is a significant anthropologist and scientist, but his main work, his contribution and negative contribution in many ways was to other humankind. He collected species, he divided everyone up into genus, in America you say genus, and to stratify everybody. So there was necessarily a hierarchy, a classification by people who saw themselves as superior. But there's a crisis of thinking, isn't there, Sam, where people believe that some museums prove some sort of white supremacy or some sort of superiority. So what about that whole question of Darwin, classification of the other, and what part it plays in contemporary dialogue? Sure. So museums, uh, uh, in, in part because of their emergence historically and, and what, they, what purpose they served in the 19th and 20th century, they're linked up, as you might imagine, as your question sort of indicated, to the professionalization of sciences like biology and the emergence of fields like paleontology. Um, not only were scientists working in museums, but of course then they were creating these public displays, which in an era before magazines or 
uh, you know, documentary films, really, or, or even the emergence of the radio, people learned first about uh, many of these things, either, you know, public debates and, and fora and, and things of that nature. And, and certainly newspapers would have existed. But if you wanted to actually see a fossil or if you wanted to actually see material from around the world that you might have been reading about in a book or in the newspaper, you would go to a museum. So uh, these became really important sites for American culture and for European culture as, as well, and certainly not without problems, but they were deemed by many people uh, to be uh, uh, accurate and uh, pretty consistent purveyors of scientific information or information about art and art history or, or history. So uh, they, they sort of became these trusted places or trusted institutions. Now, in the last few years, arguably dating back to at least right the 1980s and the culture wars uh, related to public art and, and culture wars that related to museums as well, museum controversies in the 80s and 90s, um, there's been an assault on many different institutions, right? But, it, you know, higher education and, uh, you know, many different and science in general, public health. We've seen these all sort of under attack in various sorts of ways. So museums have had to confront this again as a challenge. Uh, and I argue that they could look at the, their, their own history, the last century or more, and learn from how they've responded to crisis moments in the past. In a way, this is nothing new. Uh, but what's unique about it are, are the different players and sort of the stakes and, and how it all plays out in, in each different context as we move along in history. It's the Horniman Museum in Dulwich in London that's returning the looted Benin bronzes to Nigeria finally. I think there was also an aspect, if in Victorian literature you often read some of the writers talking about the first sight of something like a tiger or mm -hmm. a lion. Uh, for example, Blake, William Blake, much earlier on, had no idea what a tiger or a lion looked like when he wrote Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. People relied on museums not just to educate and illuminate. People don't often view museums as a place of spectacle or entertainment, but they've got better at presenting that. Do you think that's right? Well, certainly they've uh, evolved a, a huge, an extraordinary amount over time. I think that uh, people would be really interested to go back and look at photographs of uh, how museums were laid out a uh, hundred years ago and sort of compare and contrast uh, their, their approach. You know, as these collections grew and grew, there was sort of a, a there's a temptation to take all this amazing stuff that you have accumulated and put it onto exhibition. Um, and anyone who's gone to a major museum can, can tell you, but we're all sort of familiar with this idea that it can be overwhelming. It can be, you know, sensory overload. So over time during the 20th century, museums would put on fewer select pieces and try to tell a story, try to engage in some sort of narrative. Some museums are more successful at that than, than others. And, you know, another aspect of this is um, just the idea of these controversies themselves. Should museums, you know, try to shy away from these moments of controversy or do they lean in and try to transparently have a conversation with different communities that are affected by these uh, controversies and, and see what, what different people want their museum to be in the future. Um, part of the problem, right, is that if you've got a building that is 100 years old or more and it's got objects in it from around the world maybe that are, again, in many cases very old, there's sort of this idea that it's almost like encased in amber and the museum is never changing and it will always sort of house these great treasures in the same way forever. And in fact, museums have to respond to the changing conditions around them, right? The 1918 influenza epidemic or the Great Depression or the Second World War, each of these events have had a major impact on museums and so, sort of the way we look at them, uh, we misunderstand that a little bit. And your book shows how the pandemic in 1918 was dealt with and it shows the Smithsonian fire and the Spanish flu. But what we're talking in depth about are two major questions, ownership, 
And then that leads to the question of finance. We're discussing cultural misappropriation. And many people would say, so why don't these museums give stuff back, stuff, some of which includes hugely important things like uh, the Egyptology collection, Tutankhamun, etc., which has been... They wrangle and wrangle. The British Museum is still full of massive amounts of material that clearly does not belong to England just because it took it. How does one sort out the legacy of ownership in a time such as we have now when, for example, people in California are quite rightly giving misappropriated land back to African-American families? So there is this movement to return why isn't it greater than it is in museums? Mm, that last part of the question is especially especially important. Um, going back to 1990, uh, there was a major new law passed in the United States uh, called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA for short. And uh, on the one hand, that actually gave Native American tribes in the United States some ability to claim uh, objects that had been looted from grave sites uh, or dug up through an archaeological expedition from grave sites, but also objects of great cultural patrimony or really religiously important objects. But it's remarkable to me that here we are now many years past 1990, and only about 30% of the eligible ancestral remains of Native American individuals have been repatriated. So on the one hand, the door has been opened for that. And as I demonstrate in this book, The Museum, it's not just because the museum, right out of their goodwill, opened the doors to these very sacred and sensitive objects. It's because a whole bunch of activists were pushing for that outcome. Native American lawyers and uh, thinkers and writers, certainly, but also artists who were doing things like uh, making the museum or, or you know, the, the topic of the museum uh, a, a central feature in their artwork and that they would critique how Native Americans have been displayed in uh, their own artwork. So a combination of those things actually really led to change uh, or, or at least the beginnings of change that, that make it possible perhaps for a much broader conversation to happen today. There's also an ugly piece no one ever really wants to discuss, which any curator is very aware of and treads around very carefully. There are people who need to reinforce their story by creating museums that bolster the argument of superiority because it dismisses other cultures, other times, other peoples from a Anglo point of view. How is that managed in the context of a museum? Are there panels? Uh, you talked about the discussions about uh, since that law was passed, but who is taking part in these discussions? And again, I'm asking about ownership as part of this because who owns what is a very difficult thing to sort out. Another really fabulous question. I appreciate all of these. In the, the last chapter of this new book, The Museum, one of the uh, phenomenon and conversations that I look at um, actually emerges through the social media platform Twitter. Um, some museum thinkers started tweeting a hashtag and opening up a conversation under the hashtag museums are not neutral. And that opened up, served to open up in many respects, I think, a broader conversation about this question. Now they've, they've started selling other cool merchandise like museums are not neutral T-shirts and sweatshirts and things that you'll see when you go, you know, sometime to the Brooklyn Museum on a Thursday night. You'll see someone wearing uh, a museums are not neutral T-shirt. And it, I think it's actually a really important thing that we're opening up this conversation, whereas on the one hand, we're thinking about truth and fact and what is a fact and fake news and how people are those things are potentially manipulated so i think museums of course need to um see you know honor their history as this truth oriented fact finding science driven institution but we also can't confuse that with neutrality as your question indicated like the museum itself is not somehow inherently good or bad. It could be weaponized as it was in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, 
um, that there are there are places around the world that present a slanted or ideological view of history or politics uh, or science that are it suggests again that the museum is is not neutral. So I think a lot of those conversations are are happening sometimes in digital spaces, uh, sometimes in other forms of resistance uh, protest. One of the chapters in the book looks at the 1970 art strike where artists in New York City just straight up refused to work with art museums for a time. Uh, so it's it's a fascinating evolution, but I think public protest and conversation about it actually drives change in many instances. I remember in the 70s or 80s when sponsorship was invented for museums and everyone thought this was a marvelous idea. You know, attendance number were down, uh, were down in the 70s, particularly, you know, couldn't get people in because it was expensive. So they offered sponsorship. And then in 2010s and 20s, we see people like the Sacklers, and I will mention their name, the family behind the opioid epidemic, allegedly. Um, the problem is that they have contributed vast amounts of money to exhibitions and sponsorship and are much lauded. And there's an argument that goes around, we mustn't attack them, because if we attack them, the museum loses the money. So again, the money, how does a museum position itself between taking the money from the wrong people, it might be thought? Yeah, this is a... It's a challenging and important question for museums. Uh, and again, one that I was surprised to learn had really come up in the 1970 art strike. Um, that the, you know, one of the, 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 the arguments of this book is that even though there are these episodes of crisis that we can talk about, it's almost never just one thing that's happening. So the 1970 art strike, it coincides with all of these other happenings that are taking place at the same time. So it's about how artists are represented in the museum or not, but they're also protesting the Vietnam War and they're protesting sexism and the way in which Native American objects have been collected and displayed at the museum. Um, this is also, you know, in the wake of the Kent State and Jackson uh, State shootings, um, so there's a lot happening sort of embedded into that particular moment. And similarly, uh, in that era, it, it starts to emerge questions about the funders of these institutions and who's sitting on the board of uh, major institutions like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So, you know, it's not as though that had been completely absent from museum protest, but really in the 1970s, it starts to emerge. Um, but one of the things that's really kind of interesting to me is that the art strike kind of comes and goes. And as you're, you, you suggested, you know, sponsorship kind of pretty much grows in terms of a funding model for uh, many museums, as did uh, blockbuster exhibitions, right? These quite expensive displays of major artists or major uh, collections or exhibits that travel around the world and, and are, again, are quite expensive. Um, so that protest, the, some of those germs of those ideas or the germination of those ideas emerge earlier, and it takes until much later uh, for things to really fully be reconsidered. So I just guess that is to say that um, with the Sackler and, and both the, the COVID and post-COVID questions, um, that this is a, an, a clearly an evolving issue that people are thinking about and uh that there has to be a, uh, some balance there in terms of scrutinizing where funding comes from, of course, and uh, an effort to open these spaces to the broadest number of uh, people possible. So it's, it's a difficult challenge and uh, something that's certainly come up in museum history, uh, but certainly something that is not at all resolved, I would say. Exactly. And you say one of the reasons you became so interested in crises such as the COVID pandemic was because it provides an opportunity where acute questions are asked about what museums should be. They suddenly go from being abstract questions to being very concrete and real. The question is, again, who is taking part in these discussions? Mm -hmm. Is it the money men who talk about the viability of the museum going forward? Is it the uh, marketing people? Marketing people in museums are always very powerful. Is it the curators? Who is taking part in these discussions? Because it seems to me it must be quite the minefield. Absolutely. And I would say, you know, another 
example of that question relates to sexism and, and questions about gender. So uh, it, quite notably to me, but something that it is a c- common story. If, if people have studied the Great Depression, they'll know that this is a, a familiar narrative that um, starting around late 1929 into 1930, 31, as people are being let go from their jobs, often the justification was, oh, well, you're a woman working with a second salary or you have a husband or a father at home. So it's more important that I keep uh, the, the the man who is working here uh, in a similar position uh, and, and fire the, the women. And certainly that played out at, at museums like uh, uh, the University uh, Museum at the University of California, Berkeley, now the Hearst Museum, where women staffers, longtime women staffers were fired to let go, uh, whereas male staffers, security guards were uh, kept on for those uh, th- that, you know, using that sort of dated rationale. Um, and yeah, certainly the sort of the the uh, acute nature of the crisis changes, right? That um, an economic crisis is maybe different from a war or a social protest, um, and certainly they can coincide as they as they are now, right? Um, and and it it pu- pushes museums to say, for example, with the the recent COVID lockdown, you know, if a, a you know a huge part of what we are is welcoming visitors to this physical space. But if we can no longer do that, you know, how do we how do we accomplish some of our mission in digital or online spaces? And arguably, some museums are quite successful with that. They have a lot of their collection freely available online, uh, amazing resources for teachers uh, and, and us uh, at home. Uh, but other museums have struggled to sort of keep up with those many changes taking place in digital spaces. I'm wondering what the COVID conversations were amongst museum professionals in the early days and how they evolved during the pandemic. There must have been something close to panic right at the beginning when they realised they were not going to have any visitors at all and then they must have worked very hard to evolve new patterns of admission, etc. Tell me some of the early conversations and talks that you were aware of and how they changed over time. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, uh, you know, in the United States, something like 95 to 98 percent of museums shut down, at least for a time, for uh, uh, public health reasons. Um, Early on, as you may remember, right, there were a lot of conversations about cleaning high touch surfaces and, you know, people not exactly knowing uh, how the, uh, the, the virus would be transmitted. Um, and questions about whether or not, you know, museums should even reopen. Um, and sort of during that phase, and, and I guess maybe the early second wave, uh, a number of museums, uh, major museums in both the United States and, and Europe, notably the Louvre, for example, uh, were pretty assertive in doing things in terms of maintenance that uh, part of the, the issue with a museum, right, is that so many visitors are coming at any given time, potentially, that it's hard to do new construction. That, you know, if you ha- shut down a wing, you know, that's going to disappoint some visitors. Or if you're uh, working on a thoroughfare or, you know, sort of a, a hallway or something, it, it could sort of upset the flow of the museum. So some museums were doing months or years worth of maintenance work in the span of just a couple of weeks because they didn't have visitors sort of consistently coming to the museum. So they were able to accomplish certain things that they may not have otherwise. And then I would say an effort was really swung around to digital efforts, right? That as uh, kids went back to school or were in school and teachers needed access to resources that could potentially engage uh, fidgety kids, uh, and, and online and distance learning. That was a, another sort of wave of, of development. And then thinking about how to reopen. And the surveys have suggested that, um, at least in the early going of reopening, that uh, museum audiences are trending younger and they're trending uh, visitors from closer by, from more local visitors. So it's still, I haven't seen data from after the summer, um, but I, gosh, with airline travel and with other sort of challenges, Um, I think one of the opportunities that may come out of this is an opportunity to, as museums reopen, to encourage uh, uh, people from nearby communities who maybe haven't had a chance to visit the museum in a couple of years uh, to come connect with them as an institution. 
And for the financial part, how have people weathered the fiscal storm? No admissions meant no money. Absolutely. And much like during the uh, early going in the Great Depression, uh, many people did lose their job or were furloughed for um, uh, stretches of time. So that's really important to acknowledge that there are a lot of really dedicated, underpaid museum staffers who uh, care deeply about these institutions, who leap into action during times of crisis. And uh, they were hit hard in the early going of this. I see some positive signs right now in terms of hiring that um, museums, because visitors are coming back and, um, you know, uh, I think uh, philanthropically some institution, you know, places are starting to give money again. Uh, It's becoming possible to hire new staffers and and grow. Uh, So this is, again, an important transition point, but they have some catching up to do in terms of uh, having let some staffers go and already uh, uh, low wages in in some places and and a need for uh, new blood. I was going to ask you, are younger people going into the profession I mean, do you come across young people now who show signs of one day wanting to be a major curator, starting off as perhaps an apprentice to someone and working their way up, obviously having done the appropriate uh, academic study that they would have to do in some area? Are they looking for that kind of long-term job when, in fact, the gig economy means they just flit around like butterflies quite often? Well, absolutely. There's a it's a, uh, a, a remarkably growing field, and I'll say too, there are a lot of people who study uh, fields like public history and go on to be museum curators, but also uh, do other things like work in the National Park Service, um, work in uh, education. Uh, uh, I know people who have gone on and, and uh, worked in development and fundraising for amazing nonprofits, uh, doing things like corporate research. Um, There are many different possible uh, outcomes for people in in the field, Uh, but certainly a lot of people do desire to work at these amazing institutions, right, where someone can spend a a life and career working with, uh, uh, you know, touching in many cases and and, uh, helping people uh, make the past come alive. You can work with it on a day-to-day basis, and and that's very exciting for a lot of us who care uh, care deeply about uh, these objects and these places. And we like to feel, don't we, that there's a linear progress. And as we live in 2022, uh, the world has come along from, say, 1922. But unfortunately, uh, we can see that in the past, some instances of culture wars, I'm thinking particularly of what you referred to with the Smithsonian exhibition of the Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the atomic weapon on Hiroshima. That was as recent as 1995. So we could now say oh, yes, well, we handle these things much better. We tackle them face on. But it was so acrimonious that it was completely cut into bits and shredded so that very little of the true horror was shown. So are we making the progress we so often pat ourselves on the back for? Mm, Another great question. Um, And I hate to keep answering, you know, looking at sort of the the mixed bag nature of some of the the answers. Um, uh, I do see some ways in which there's very little progress. Uh, uh, you, you usually, I'm an, I'm an optimistic uh, point of view type of person, but uh, for example, the you know the Anola Gay. I don't know that it still has been fully uh, uh, treated and interpreted uh, for public visitors. I think you know they mostly stripped down the the narrative uh, surrounding that and tried to make it as uh, quote unquote apolitical as possible um arguably doing a disservice to the the national museum right not letting you know sort of the experts uh do their job in terms of um uh studying researching and and uh, uh teaching about this object in a way that helps us contextualize what it really is um, so in some ways, there's a lack of progress. Um, in other ways, uh, the Smithsonian learned a lot from the Enola Gay episode. Um, it learned uh, that, you know, one of the problems of, of the story is that the uh, exhibit draft text was leaked before it was ready. 
um, that arguably there wasn't enough uh, consultation in advance with all of the different constituencies to understand what the sensitivities might be of this uh, this story that still involved people with who were alive when uh, when it happened. Um, and then once it uh, was out there, the Smithsonian didn't stick to its guns, right? That um, it ultimately uh, acquiesced to some of this criticism uh, in a way that they sort of learned uh, in terms of process. You know, we're going to do this consultation up front and consider all the various sensitivities, but then make a decision and, and try to stick with it. Another area where arguably you have some progress is that since the 1990s, you have a whole slew of new museums that have not only opened up, but taken on by virtue of their topics and, and approach, uh, really sensitive subject matter. So the Holocaust Museum, the National Museum of American Indian History, uh, and uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, as well as the emerging Latino Museum are several examples that where difficult and challenging history is really at the forefront. And attendance figures suggest that there's a desire for that, that these museums are, are quite popular. And hasn't it taken a long time? And if you consider the discussions about some people in the United States who argue that when Columbus came to America, no one was here, obviously museums are very much more important than we're willing to acknowledge. So finally, Samuel J. Redmond, do you believe the museum is a model, virtual or otherwise, both, is viable going forward? And what is the key factor in keeping the physical museum going when presumably there are battles over the real estate? I mean, you could turn a museum, God forbid, into a condo or whatever else greedy people would want to do. But how viable is the museum going forward? Right. So I think this book is in some ways my uh, a statement that I, I do think the museum is a viable institution and that it can be viable a hundred years into the future. Um, but as a historian, as someone who cares deeply about museums and, and also uses the past as a way to understand the present, I think that museums can more critically look at their past. They can more critically examine what happened during the 1918 to 1920 era, where you have an influenza epidemic, you have uh, racial unrest and protest, where you have an economic uh, uh, uncertainty following World War I. Um, so, you know, these things can in some ways provide inspiration or serve as something of a roadmap for how museums can uh, face impending crisis moments that are around the corner. And I guess that is the one sort of last major rejoinder that I would suggest is that even though these are institutions that have been around for some time, they maybe uh, have these monumental looking buildings, they're not invincible. Museums have closed, they've faced hurricanes and fires and floods and different changing ideas over time. So uh, museum directors and leaders need to think broadly and in some ways, pretty creatively about what the next financial crisis or m next crisis could be, because we can't fully anticipate what that may look like around the corner. We just have to hope it's not another case of you don't know what you've got till it's gone. I would recommend our listeners look you up, Samuel J. Redman. You have marvelous discussions about the importance of oral history, for example. Uh, and how you personally are very keen on people make, maintaining a familial oral history and so many other subjects. Samuel J. Redman, whose new book is The Museum, A Short History of Crisis and Resilience, well worth a read. It is described as a taught, academic, very well produced and thought out book. I highly recommend it. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you for having me.